There had never before been such a grand procession through Rome as the procession to celebrate the military victories of Julius Caesar. The Senate had decreed the celebrations would last forty days, and altogether there would be four processions of triumph, one each for Caesar's victories in Gaul, Spain, Asia, and Africa. On the first day of triumph, the streets were garlanded with flowers, and throughout the city altars were ablaze with incense. At the front of the parade were the city officials, followed by dozens of trumpeters. Then came the chariots, loaded down with the treasures taken from Gaul. Behind them came men bearing signs that listed the names of all the nations and towns Caesar had conquered. Behind these were the paintings which portrayed the battles and notable events in the war. The priests followed next with the animals that were to be sacrificed to the Roman gods. There were human sacrifices too, kings and chieftains Caesar had captured. Towards the end of the parade came the musicians, followed by an honor guard, and then, standing proud in his chariot, came Caesar himself. Behind him marched his loyal soldiers. A few days later came the second procession in honor of Caesar's victories in Egypt. It was much like the first, except this time one of the spectators was Queen Cleopatra of Egypt, who watched with satisfaction as her own sister, who had betrayed her, marched by in chains as a prisoner of Caesar. In the days that followed, there were two more processions, just as elaborate as the others. Then the other festivities began: a public banquet for the poor, in which Caesar gave twenty thousand people cash and gifts. A ceremony at which Caesar awarded his soldiers land, promotions, and cash bonuses, sporting and theatrical events in the stadium, including a hunt that featured four hundred lions and a mock naval battle on the artificial lake. So many people flocked to these events that visitors were camped out in tents all over the streets and roads, and the crush of people was so great that many, including two senators, were crushed to death. It was Caesar's greatest moment of glory, a moment he had envisioned and fought for for over twenty years. There would never be another moment like it, for only a year later, some of the very people who joined in the celebrations that day would conspire to murder him. After his death, Caesar became a legend of such gigantic proportions that he seems superhuman. He was, in fact, very human and even fallible. But he was also one of the most brilliant military leaders in history, a gifted orator and writer, a man of astounding energy and confidence, a skilled and generous ruler, and the man who almost single-handedly transformed Rome from a small, powerful republic into the beginnings of a world empire. The early life of Julius Caesar showed almost no sign of his exceptional capabilities and future. He was almost middle-aged before he showed any direction or ambition, and the bulk of his career is condensed into the last two decades of his life. He was born on either July twelfth or thirteenth, probably in the year one hundred B.C., although some historians put it a little earlier, in the year one o two B.C. Legend has it that he was descended from the gods and that he was pulled forth from an incision in his mother's body. Thus, the modern term for surgical births called cesarean sections. His full name, Gaius Julius Caesar, had been the name of his father and his grandfather before him. Family names often started as nicknames, and Caesar meant Harry. The Caesars were members of the aristocracy, but they held no real power in Rome. One of Caesar's uncles, Marius Caesar, had made a name for himself as a champion of the people. A fierce warrior and an ambitious politician who rose high in the Roman ranks, the Caesars, although members of the nobility, were known for their sympathy for the middle working class. Rome at the time of Caesar was a republic in the heart of the Mediterranean that included the areas of Italy, Sicily, Macedonia, Greece, and parts of Spain and North Africa. It was not yet an empire. And it was still dealing with rebellions and disorganization in its provinces, and constant political disputes and shifts of power at home.
but the Romans were beginning to enjoy the riches of their provinces, and life for many was filled with luxury. A law had been passed that no Roman had to pay taxes, since the treasury could easily be filled with taxes from the territories. As a result, there was a richer class in Rome than there'd ever been before, and this class loved to flaunt its wealth. The wealthy built magnificent palaces and villas, furnished with ornate furniture and beautiful murals. They built extensive gardens and gave long, drawn-out feasts at which they served rare wines and exotic delicacies, like nightingales' tongues and mice cooked in honey. Dancers, acrobats, and musicians entertained the guests, who were served by a large staff of slaves. A wealthy man was followed by a train of slaves wherever he went. These slaves came from all over the Roman territories. Most of them had once been free men and women who were taken captive by the Romans. Sometimes these slaves rose in rebellion, as happened when the famous gladiator Spartacus led a revolt. He, like all the others, was defeated by the Roman army. The life of luxury and privilege was not the life of most Romans, however. The majority of the population lived in crowded tenements on narrow streets and ate bread and olives, and a porridge made of wheat with a few vegetables thrown in. Rich and poor alike attended the most popular events in Rome, the games held at the arena at the expense of the state. These games included deadly chariot races and fights to the death between gladiators who were slaves and criminals specially trained for the sport. In spite of the love of luxury and brutality that marked ancient Rome, there was also a love of law and order and higher education. As an aristocrat, Caesar received a good education as a child. He learned Greek and Latin, philosophy, and most importantly, rhetoric, the art of persuasive argument. When he was only twelve, he was taken to the Senate to hear the speeches and debates and to watch the politicians at work. In spite of these early influences, Caesar showed no real interest in politics as a young man. Instead, he was known more as a dandy and a ladies' man. He wrote poetry, dabbled in science, gave lavish parties, went into debt, and had affairs with allegedly both men and women, many of them married. He was known his whole life for his insatiable sexual appetites, which even by the loose standards of the Romans were considered extreme. His only role in public life was an appointment to the post of priest of Jupiter, an appointment arranged by his family. The priesthood in ancient Rome was not a spiritual calling, but a political office. Caesar's family also arranged his first marriage to a young woman named Cornelia, who was the daughter of one of his famous uncle's friends. When he linked himself with Cornelia, he linked himself with the radical political set her father belonged to. When his uncle was driven out of Rome by an opponent named Sulla, Sulla demanded that Caesar divorce Cornelia. Caesar refused, whether from love of his wife or defiance of his uncle's enemy, is unknown. That refusal, however, put him in mortal danger, so Caesar fled Rome for the countryside. He lived in exile for months, then returned to Rome when he heard Sulla was willing to grant him a pardon. Caesar briefly tried to make a name for himself by prosecuting two corrupt officials who worked under Sulla. One case he lost and one he won, but in both he was eloquent and made a good impression on the judges. Caesar had problems now. Sulla was his enemy again, and his debts were sky high. He decided to leave Rome again and took a ship for the east. This turned into a famous episode in Caesar's life when the ship was captured by pirates who took him prisoner and held him for ransom. When they told Caesar the ransom would be $30,000, he was filled with scorn and told them he was worth at least 70000 They agreed and raised the ransom. While his friends tried to gather the funds, Caesar spent 40 days with his captives. During this whole time, he liked to joke that he would someday capture them all and crucify them, a joke that always got lots of uproarious laughter in response. Since Caesar was often reciting poetry to them or practicing his oration, they assumed it was one of his playful games. But when the ransom was paid and Caesar was set free, the first thing he did was organize a fleet 
and chase after the pirates. He captured them and kept his word. They were crucified to the last man. After the adventure with the pirates, Caesar went to Rhodes to study rhetoric with a famous teacher, then returned to Rome when he heard that a family member had died, and the man's seat in the College of Priests was being held for Caesar. Since the College of Priests could lead to the office of High Priest of Rome, a very powerful position, Caesar decided to take it. He was now twenty-six years old, and just beginning his first tentative steps towards power. Shortly after he entered the College of Priests, Caesar was also elected to a military tribunal. It offered him few duties or influence, but he began to make contacts and was in a position to grant certain favors. He was liberal with those favors. He used them to increase his popularity and keep himself in the public eye. He also began to use every opportunity he could to make public speeches, including the deaths of both his aunt and his young wife, Cornelia. Both times his speeches were less about the deceased and more about his uncle Marius, who had been a defender of the rights of the people. Those people showed their gratitude by electing Caesar as one of the treasury masters for a province in Spain. He still didn't seem to have any definite goal or plan of action, but that changed one day when he was about twenty-six and made a journey to his province in Spain, where he came upon a statue of Alexander the Great. It said that when he came upon Alexander's statue, Caesar began to groan, so sickened was he by his own lack of action and success. He commented on how he had done nothing worthy in life, whereas Alexander, at the same age, had already conquered the world. Caesar left the statue, anxious to return to Rome, and determined to use every opportunity to distinguish himself. In Rome at that time there were two men who were running the show. One was Gnaeus Pompey, a former soldier with Caesar's old enemy, Sulla, and the other was Marcus Crassus, the wealthiest man in the city. Pompey and Crassus hated each other, and Caesar cleverly saw how he could be of help to each one. Crassus could use Caesar's popularity with the people. Pompey could use Caesar's contacts. For himself, Caesar could use Crassus's money. If he was going to run for office, it would be a very expensive matter, since most votes in Roman elections were purchased. Later, just to wrap everything up in a neat bundle, Caesar married a relative of Pompey named Pompeia, and offered his only child, Julia, as Pompey's wife. Once the women and favors had been traded, the groundwork had been laid for a strong three-way partnership. Caesar then set out to increase his own popularity with the public. He spent a fortune, most of it borrowed, on organizing public games, decorating public squares, and offering gifts to the people. The Roman Senate, which was made up only of aristocrats, began to mistrust Caesar. They saw, and rightly so, a man who would always appeal to the public on his behalf, and who might try and limit their own privileges. These feelings would increase over the years until they finally culminated in the bloody confrontation on the Ides of March. At this time, a very high and important office in Rome became vacant, the office of high priest. Caesar wanted it, but there was an obstacle. The high priest was elected by the Senate. So he came up with a plan. He had a friend introduce a bill in the people's assembly that would return to them the right to elect the high priest. The people's assembly, although equal to the Senate, was a legislative body made up of the middle and lower classes. The bill was approved, and shortly after, the assembly voted Caesar into office. The Senate now knew what it had before only suspected. Julius Caesar was shrewd and ambitious. He was a man to keep an eye on. The aristocratic or patrician party in Rome was headed by two men, Cicero, the greatest orator of Rome, and the only man who could outdo Caesar in public speaking, and Cato. Standing against them were Caesar and Crassus, patrician by birth but aligned with the populace. In modern terms, Cato and Cicero were conservatives, even reactionaries. Caesar and Crassus were liberals, Democrats in certain principles. But all four were hungry for power. The only other man to be reckoned with was Pompey, who still hadn't committed to either side. Caesar set out to change that. 
Before he could settle matters with Pompey, however, Caesar had a personal scandal involving his wife Pompeia that had to be resolved. Every year in Rome, a feast was held in honor of the goddess Bona Dia at the house of one of Rome's leading women. The feast was for women only, no men allowed. In 62 B.C., when Caesar was 38 years old, Pompeia was chosen as hostess for the event. For some reason, probably her own amusement and pleasure, she smuggled in a young man disguised as a woman. Unfortunately, his deep voice gave him away, and the society matrons were outraged. The young man was brought to trial for blasphemy, and Cicero, one of the conservative opponents of Caesar, testified against him. Caesar, too, was called to testify, but he refused to say anything against the young man. The case was eventually dropped, but soon afterward, Caesar surprised Rome by divorcing Pompeia. He explained his action with the now-famous comment, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. It was a hard comment to take seriously in view of Caesar's own loose morals, which were well known in Rome, but it served the purpose of holding the loyalty of his followers. When he was thirty-nine, Caesar took another leap forward when he was appointed governor of the Spanish province. With this appointment came a profound change in Caesar's character. He suddenly lost his idle and pleasure-seeking ways and turned himself into a first-class soldier. He campaigned with his troops, sharing the same hardships of plain food, long marches, and sleeping in the open in all kinds of weather. He expanded the province, winning new lands for Rome off the Atlantic coast, and straightened out the messy finances of the area. He returned to Rome triumphant, and with his new power, he formed an alliance with Pompey, who had quarreled with the Senate. Now the three of them, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, were a united force determined to take over the government of Rome. They were called the Triumvirate. Caesar then took his third and last wife, Calpurnia, the daughter of one of Pompey's important officials. Everything was now in place, and Caesar's rise to the top proceeded swiftly. He managed to get almost any legislation he wanted passed by a variety of methods. If the Senate was uncooperative, he took his bills to the People's Assembly, where he always had support. When powerful men like Cato tried to speak against him, he would call Pompey's guards and have his opponents driven from the forum. He manipulated important opponents for his supporters. For himself, he landed an appointment that put him in charge of the territories of Gaul, in what is known today as France. No sooner did he have this appointment than he heard that a Germanic tribe was preparing to invade Gaul. Immediately, Caesar gathered his troops and headed north, never dreaming that he wouldn't return to Rome again for nine years. These nine years, when Caesar was between the ages of forty-two and fifty-one, were the years of his great military victories and the peak of his brilliance and energy. The troops he led into Gaul were the finest in the world and among the finest in all of history. They were highly trained, well-disciplined, and dedicated. Soldiers in the Roman army signed on for twenty years and swore allegiance not to Rome, but to their general. The backbone of the army were the officers known as centurions. They trained the troops and led them into action, and their skill and experience was so extensive they often helped the generals plan their campaigns. Each was in charge of a one-hundred-man unit called a century. A full Roman legion had sixty units, or six thousand men. The regular foot soldiers were called legionnaires. They carried two eight-foot javelins, which they could hurl twenty yards, and a sword for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Each carried a rectangular shield that covered him from chin to ankle, and wore a tunic of iron mail. The soldiers wore helmets with a wide neckpiece, and iron flaps that could be used to cover the sides of their faces. Caesar's army also had a corps of engineers who planned and built forts, laid out roads, repaired weapons, and came up with all the clever devices Caesar thought up for defeating his enemies. Sometimes a wall, so they couldn't retreat. Sometimes a ramp, so he could gain access to a fort. Sometimes a bridge, so he could reach them across a river. Like Alexander the Great had done, he innovated his way to victory time and time again.
He adapted to every different battle and circumstance, and changed his methods and weapons to suit each one. He attacked with speed and full force, often surprising the enemy and breaking its organization early in the battle. He himself was everywhere at once, shouting encouragement, keeping his men in formation, and even leading them into battle. With this superb army and his brilliant engineers, Caesar cut a swath of victory across hundreds of miles of new territories, often defeating armies that badly outnumbered his own. Sometimes he was merciful, sparing the survivors and sending them back to their communities. Other times, his soldiers butchered men, women, and children by the thousands. His response depended on whether he felt he'd been insulted and deceived, or whether he felt the fight had been honorable and courageous. Through it all, he used his masterful skills of oratory, second only to the famous Cicero, to encourage his men and rouse them to seek glory. He would shame them, inspire them, use any tactic that would get them to fight and fight well. In his first campaigns, Caesar gained control of two-thirds of Gaul. Then he moved north into Germany and Belgium in pursuit of enemy tribes, gaining a new province for Rome. Later, when he wrote a report of his victories, it began with the now famous words, All Gaul is divided into three parts. The Gaul he spoke of is what we know today as most of Western Europe. After reaching the far northern limit of Gaul, in Belgium, Caesar turned his attention to Britain, because the island had become a refuge for rebel Gauls that had escaped his army. The attack on Britain was never completed, however, because Caesar received word that the Gauls were again rising against Rome, in spite of the fact that he had killed or captured all of their leaders. This had been a fear for Caesar ever since he conquered Gaul. He felt he didn't have enough troops to maintain order in the vast territory, and he suspected his whirlwind campaigns had dazed more than defeated them. He rushed back to Gaul and launched a new campaign aimed at reasserting his power. While the battles in Gaul proceeded, Caesar's worries shifted for a time back to Rome. He'd received word that his daughter Julia had died. And personal grief aside, he was concerned that his most important tie with Pompey, who had married Julia, was now broken. Not only that, but Crassus and Pompey were quarreling. The triumvirate was in danger, and Caesar, thousands of miles away, was helpless. It took Caesar one year to break the Gaul rebellion, and as soon as it was done, he headed south to be nearer to Rome, where he hoped to strengthen his power base. He didn't want to enter Rome itself, because he was unsure what his welcome would be. Besides his problems with the triumvirate, many senators had used Caesar's absence as an opportunity to foster opposition to him. Cato had even suggested his exile. Instead, Caesar decided to run for the office of consulate while he was out of the country. His plan was to enlist the aid of his supporters to successfully run his campaign for him in Rome and outwit his opponents. Among these would be his friend Mark Antony, a soldier who had fought with Caesar earlier in Gaul and now held two influential posts in Rome. Antony was an honorable man, with deep loyalties to Caesar. The historian Plutarch had described him as having a very good and noble appearance, a bold, masculine look that reminded people of the appearance of Hercules in paintings and sculptures. He was admired by the Romans, and Caesar knew he could be trusted. But even Antony couldn't help with the problems rapidly developing in Rome. So serious were they. Rumors were spreading that Caesar was preparing to enter with four legions and launch a civil war. Senators were uniting against him, led by Pompey, his former colleague and son-in-law. The order went out that he must give up his command and send his armies back to Rome. In 49 B.C., when he was 51 years old, Caesar was forced to make a critical decision at a river that separated Gaul from Italy. It was called the Rubicon. Today, the phrase, crossing the Rubicon, is still used to refer to a decision of critical importance, from which there's no turning back. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon with his army and marched towards Rome, 
he was defying his government and accepting the challenge of civil war. Legend has it that as Caesar reached the Rubicon, he hesitated. As he pondered, a figure of superhuman size was seen on the bank. It snatched a trumpet from a soldier, blew a mighty blast, and then ran into the river and crossed it. Caesar, accepting this as a sign from the gods, was said to remark, Iacta alia est. The die is cast. Caesar marched through northern Italy unchallenged. Forces along the way either retreated or joined his army. Day by day, Caesar advanced, and day by day, Pompey retreated further into the south of Italy. When Pompey's army fled to Spain, leaving Pompey himself in Italy, Caesar followed them, and in only two months had control of the entire province. Then he headed back to the southern tip of Italy to defeat Pompey himself. The two armies met on the plain of Pharsalia in the summer of 48 B.C. to fight the decisive battle of the Civil War. Pharsalia was a disaster for Pompey, and he barely managed to escape with his life. He fled to Egypt, where he hoped he'd be given asylum. But instead, the Egyptians, anxious to win favor with the powerful Caesar, executed Pompey. It's said that when Caesar arrived in Egypt days later and was presented with the head of his enemy and former friend, he wept. When Caesar arrived in Egypt, there was a power struggle going on between Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy, and Cleopatra had been forced out of the country. She returned, allegedly hidden in a rolled-up carpet, and pleaded with Caesar for his intervention. Although the relationship between Caesar and Cleopatra has been glamorized by many writers, including Shakespeare, and dramatized in modern movies, it was indeed a romance. Cleopatra was then a spirited and ambitious young woman of twenty-one, although her beauty has probably been exaggerated, and Caesar admired and related to her. He restored her to the throne of Egypt and took her as his mistress, lingering in Egypt so long that his men feared he would lose his influence in Rome. Caesar finally left, after making plans that Cleopatra would join him there later. On his way back, Caesar stopped first in Asia Minor, where he defeated armies that were trying to annex lands in the eastern area. After his victory at Zella, in what is now Turkey, he sent a dispatch to Rome with the immortal message, Veni Vidi Vici! I came, I saw... I conquered. When he finally made it back to Rome, the year was 47 B.C., and he was 53 years old. Mark Antony had been ruling in his absence. But Antony was an ineffectual ruler who spent most of his time amusing himself with his rowdy friends. Caesar very quickly took charge. He filled the spaces left empty in the Senate when Pompey's followers had all deserted, and he had himself elected consul. But he had barely begun to reorganize when word reached him that many of Pompey's followers, including Cato and two of Pompey's sons, had gathered an army of 35,000 men in Africa and were preparing to reclaim Rome. Caesar sailed for Africa, knowing that a fierce campaign awaited him and that rulership of Rome was at stake. In the first battle, his troops managed to trap the enemy on a narrow isthmus over the water and the army was slain to the very last man. There were a few more battles, and before long, Caesar was in control of all Roman Africa. Caesar now reigned supreme in the entire Mediterranean world. When he returned to Rome, he was honored with the forty days of celebration and four processions that were his greatest moment of triumph. There would be only one more triumph before the career of Julius Caesar came abruptly to an end. The followers of Pompey, who had survived the battles in Africa, had now regrouped in Spain. Once more, Caesar set out to defeat them, and once more he achieved his goal. The civil war was now at last ended, and Caesar returned to Rome a hero. In gratitude, the state offered him unprecedented awards and privileges— he was to be dictator for ten years and had the right to nominate candidates for all key offices. Soon after, he was given dictatorship for life. Magistrates had to swear not to oppose any of his decrees. And most extraordinary of all, the person Caesar was declared inviolable or sacred.
Statues and temples were built to him, and the month of Quintilis, his birth month, was renamed Julius. Today, we know it as July. In the Senate groups, there were a variety of responses to all this glorification of Caesar. Some hoped and even believed he'd stay within the limits of the Constitution. Some hoped he'd give up his uncommon powers, a hope that turned out to be completely futile. Still others feared he would make revolutionary changes in the government and the empire. What Caesar did do was initiate legislation aimed at eliminating injustices against the masses. He cracked down on corruption. He relieved the burden of debtors, and he gave citizens of Gaul the right to vote. He handed out grain and changed zoning so the people crowded in the tenements could spread out into broader areas. He won the favor of the people, but he steadily lost the support of the aristocracy. Caesar also tried to make his own personal rule stronger and more direct. He regulated the amount of money coming into the treasury. He limited the terms of governors in the provinces to two years. He abolished political clubs, where many of the intrigues and political violence in Rome were thought up. He even passed a law that limited the degree of luxury and ostentation that wealthy people could display. In one of his most lasting contributions, he ordered that the Roman calendar, which was then only 355 days, be lengthened to 365 and a quarter days. Under his command, extensive engineering and improvement projects were begun, including channels, roads, canals, and the building of libraries and theaters. He was an efficient and effective leader, with a focus on reform. Had he been given another twenty years, he may have created one of the most progressive societies in history. But he didn't have another twenty years. Every new project was criticized and opposed by the conservatives and patricians. Many were angered by their loss of personal privileges. Some were offended by the presence of Cleopatra in Rome, since they considered Egyptians their inferiors, and almost all his opponents were distressed by the immense power Caesar had. Rome was a republic, and was supposed to be governed by vote, and the will of the Senate and the Assembly of People. Now, Caesar's will governed Rome. There were even fears that he would name himself king, destroying the republic altogether. On the surface, Caesar had always discouraged such ideas. Once when someone in a crowd hailed him as a king, he had silenced them. Another time, when Antony had placed a crown on Caesar's head, he had immediately removed it. Still, he didn't rise from his seat when addressed by the senators, a sign that he considered them his inferiors. And a statue of Caesar was once found adorned with a diadem, the emblem of royalty. It was a senator named Gaius Cassius who first began to talk of assassination. Soon he had sixty men agreeing with him. Among them was Marcus Brutus, who some believed was Caesar's illegitimate son. Caesar had once had a long affair with Brutus's mother, and even with her daughter, Brutus's sister. Brutus had been born shortly after. Caesar had always shown special favoritism for Brutus. In the battle against Pompey, he gave specific orders that Brutus was not to be harmed, even though he'd sided with Pompey. Brutus was not a strong man. He was weak and somewhat bookish. But he had prestige in Rome, and the conspirators thought their deed would win more popular support with Brutus on their side. They fixed the date of the assassination for March 15th, the Ides of March. The plan was that when Caesar arrived at the Senate, there would be a signal, and each man would approach and stab Caesar. They wanted it done right in the open, where it would look like an honorable deed committed for the sake of the Republic. The evening of March 14th, Caesar was gathered with some friends when the subject of death came up. They were debating what kind of death was most desirable, and Caesar, then fifty-six years old, is reported to have said, a sudden one. That night, Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, had horrible dreams, which she took as an omen. The next morning she begged him not to go to the Senate. Caesar, though unaffected by her dreams, wasn't feeling well and decided to stay home after all. When he failed to appear at the Senate building, the conspirators were worried. Perhaps he had found out about their plan.
One of them volunteered to visit Caesar's house and see if he could determine what was going on. When the senator arrived and found out about Calpurnia's dream, he derided her fears and suggested it wasn't proper for a man such as Caesar to be influenced by a woman's dreams. Caesar, who was feeling better by this time, agreed to go to the Senate as planned. As Caesar stepped from his litter before the Senate building, a friend rushed up and quickly handed him a note. But the crush of the crowd was so great that Caesar had no chance to read it. Just before he entered the building, he saw a soothsayer who sometime earlier had warned him about the Ides of March. "'The Ides of March have come,' he said. "'Yes,' she replied, "'but not gone.' As Caesar crossed the threshold into the Senate, his friend Mark Antony began to follow him, but was detained in conversation by one of the conspirators. Inside, Caesar walked to his seat. A small group of men approached him, and one of them, while begging for a favor, pulled back Caesar's toga to reveal his chest and neck. It was the signal agreed upon beforehand. The others all attacked as one, thrusting their daggers into Caesar. He received twenty wounds, many from men who had accepted his favors and whom he believed were his friends. He struggled and fought against them, but it said he gave up the fight when he saw Brutus approaching. As Brutus stabbed him, Caesar covered his face with his toga and moaned, At tu, Brute? You too, Brutus? Some say he actually said, Even you, my son? Then he collapsed and died. As soon as the mighty Caesar fell, there were cries from the rest of the Senate, and everyone fled the room. When the assassins appeared with their bloody daggers, people fled the streets in terror. For weeks after, the streets of Rome were racked by riots. Eventually, the assassination was avenged. Several thousand Romans were executed for the death of Caesar, including the renowned orator Cicero. Brutus and Cassius committed suicide when their armies were defeated later by Antony. Later, Antony himself was killed in battle, and Cleopatra, who had taken him as her lover, committed suicide. Cato had killed himself after the defeat of Pompey. Almost every participant in this historical saga of ancient Rome met a violent death. The governorship of Rome passed to Caesar's nephew, Octavian, as specified in his will. It would fall to Octavian, who renamed himself Augustus, to rule the glorious empire that Julius Caesar had begun. In the two millennia since Caesar lived and died, his name has continued as one of the most famous and most controversial figures of history. He is considered either a defender of the rights of the people, or an ambitious politician who used the people to force his way to power, and in so doing destroyed the republic. He was a ruthless tyrant to some, to others a generous benefactor. All that remains certain about Caesar is that he was a man of exceptional, almost unbelievable abilities. He rose from relative obscurity to become the founder of the Roman Empire. He fought extensive and challenging military campaigns in the Empire, and he was victorious in every single one of them. His physical energy was phenomenal. He traveled over vast amounts of territories and launched quick, forceful assaults, one after another, without rest. Even at the age of fifty-three, he saved himself in one battle by a long, vigorous swim to shore. In his later years, he periodically had epileptic seizures, none of which slowed him down nor interfered with his work. His governorship of Rome was equally as energetic. He formulated and passed laws in rapid succession, while also writing volumes of eloquent literature on his travels, his campaigns, and his legislation. His writing skills were matched by his skills at oratory. He gave frequent and brilliant speeches that swayed whole regiments, crowds, and legislators. Everything about Julius Caesar was uncommon, even his dramatic death. His life was fairly short, and his rulership ended almost as soon as it had begun. But his name survives. Even today... There is no word that evokes the human supremacy and power as the word Caesar.